Trust in God, Part 4. So this concluding part of this series, we're going to talk about the importance of acquiring trust in God while in this life. We've saved the best for last in some respects. So, as you know, unless you're starting with this one, which I don't know why you would, uh, you can get these books on Amazon and in print from my blog. Uh, and these talks, as always, are not a replacement for the writing. They're, it's complementary, but uh, you'll, you'll learn different things from the two resources. Okay, so the point of this presentation is to talk about how trust in God must be acquired in this life. There's a spirit of, no, I'm good, that, that's pervasive in Christianity and outside of Christianity, I think just in this life. Everyone has the I'm good attitude, also known as everything they know is all there is to know. And that's really not a good attitude to have. It turns out that there's tremendous um, urgency to learn these things while in this life. And after you watch this, maybe you'll believe that. Joseph Smith once said, when you climb up a ladder, you must begin at the bottom and descend step by step until you arrive at the top. And so it is with the principles of the gospel. You must begin with the first and go on until you learn all the principles of exaltation. But it will be a great while after you have passed through the veil before you will have learned them. It is not all to be comprehended in this world. It will be a great work to learn our salvation and exaltation even beyond the grave. And some who know about this quote use it to justify a lackadaisical attitude towards progression. And they would say, well, yeah, I don't trust in God completely, but that's okay because I have uh, all this time after I die where I can pick these things up. Well, you're wrong, and I'll explain why. In Alma 41, it says, I say unto thee, my son, that the plan of restoration is requisite with the justice of God, for it is requisite that all things should be restored to their proper order. Behold, it is requisite and just, according to the power and resurrection of Christ, that the soul of man should be restored to its body, and that every part of the body should be restored to itself. And it is requisite with the justice of God that men should be judged according to their works, and if their works were good in this life, and the desires of their hearts were good, that they should also at the last day be restored unto that which is good. So if in this life their works were good and their desires were good, they'll be restored to that which is good. Restored does not mean upgraded. Restored does not mean that somehow they'll have something better than what they had before. Restored means equal to. It means to come back. A lot of people believe that the gospel has power to save them after they die. But they don't believe that the gospel has power to save them before they die. The scriptures are very clear that God's power is equal here and there, and that a religion that doesn't have power to save you before you die doesn't have power to save you after you die. And if you believe in that kind of sort of magic wand theology, then um, I fear to be the person to pay your bills because you're probably very easy to sell things to. So that'd be like buying a car and the person says, no, you can't take it for a test drive because it doesn't work. The engine's completely shot. But after you pay for it, it will magically work, I promise. So write me the check and let's close the deal. In DNC 88, we read, they, are, they who are of a celestial spirit shall receive the same... It's talking about the resurrection. They who are of a celestial spirit shall receive the same body which was a natural body. Even ye shall receive your bodies, and your glory shall be that glory by which your bodies are quickened. So there's some language here like quickened and glory and celestial. But the point here is not what those words mean. It means that when you die... When you exit this life, the state that you are in, in terms of your knowledge of God and your trust in Him, that's the state you will be returned to when you're resurrected. If you are uh, of a low degree of trust in God when you die, when you're resurrected, that will not change. That's very important. So... Then we continue to read, Ye who are quickened by a portion of the celestial glory shall then receive of the same even a fullness. 
And in a minute, I'll show you a picture that talks about what this fullness is compared to what you start out with when you're resurrected. And they who are quickened by a portion of terrestrial glory shall then receive the same, even a fullness. And also they who are quickened by a portion of celestial glory shall then receive of the same, even a fullness. So there's three levels here that are described. Here's the picture. Your trust in God can come in three levels. And I described previously what these levels were without using the phrases celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. But um, there they are. These are discrete levels. Um, telestial terrestri and terrestrial have an end. Celestial has a beginning. That's important because if you're going to continue, you can't have an end. If you're going to continue in growth. And that's the, the crowning distinguishing feature from celestial to ter terrestrial or telestial. There, there is no end. Anyway, so what happens is, let's say that you obtain a celestial glory in this life. The way this works is you start out learning things of the lowest order and, and learning things that these are dots in this picture. So you learn some things at that level, then all of a sudden you obtain a higher degree of trust in God. And what that does is it allows you to learn things in a greater state of awareness. And this keeps happening, and then one day you die. And when you die, you continue in the state of trusting God that you were at the time of your death. But the difference is you learn all things, not just some things. So the dots become solid over time, in quotes, after you die, right? But over experience after you die, until you know all things. All things is in quotes too, because truth continues and it has no end. But and that hence the dot dot dot. But I hope you get the picture. These are discrete levels. And so as you obtain different degrees of trust, you radically expand the scope and depth of things that God can teach you. So going back to the quote we started with, the quote is correct, but the interpretation I, I mentioned is not. Turns out that uh, although we acquire more knowledge after we die, it's like the black dots in the last picture, you don't change your degree of trust or your kingdom out of this world. This world is the place to do that. Let's read some scriptures that back that up. This is from Alma 12. Sorry, I omitted the verse number. And we see that death comes upon mankind, yea, the death which has been spoken of by Amulek, which is the temporal death. Nevertheless, there was a space granted unto man in which he might repent. Therefore, this life became a probationary state, a time to prepare to meet God, a time to prepare for that endless state which has been spoken of by us, which is after the resurrection of the dead. Do you get the dichotomy here? There's a time before you die. This life is a probationary state, a time to prepare to meet God. This life is when you develop your trust in God. Then there is an endless state after you die, after resurrection, and you can still learn things there, but that is not where you prepare to meet God. Alma 34.33 says, And now, as I said unto you before, as ye have had so many witnesses, therefore I beseech of you that ye do not procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end. That's exactly what these interpreters of that quote do. They are proponents of this idea that, well, I don't have to really obey God here because I can figure that out later. I can just kind of do a half-hearted effort and it's, it's all good. For after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity... Behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. This isn't the only place that says this. There is a time where, quote, there can be no labor performed. That doesn't mean you can't keep learning things or improving. It means that your trust in God and the awareness limitations that come with that are set when you die. This life is the only place where you can change that. 
where you can move the bar. In Alma 34, 32 and 33, it says, For behold, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yea, behold, the day of this life is the day for men to perform their labors. And now, as I said unto you before, as ye have had so many witnesses, therefore I beseech of you that ye do not procrastinate the day of your repentance until the end. For after this day of life, which is given us to prepare for eternity, behold, if we do not improve our time while in this life, then cometh the night of darkness, wherein there can be no labor performed. Finally, this is just a sampling. There are more scriptures, but I try to keep this short. In DNC 130.18, it says, Whatever principle of intelligence we attain unto in this life, it will rise with us in the resurrection. So, as a conclusion to this series, I invite you to consider the urgency of increasing the trust you have in God while in this life, because you will find that there is a time when it's too late to do that. So I encourage you to repent and learn more about God and trust in Him while you still can.